Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, forum for uh, city council candidates in Montpelier. I'm Joe Choquette with the Montpelier Rotary Club, and the Rotary is pleased to sponsor this event. We're also delighted that we have uh, cooperation of the bridge, and managing editor uh, Cassandra Hemingway will be our moderator. Our timer is Donna Bate, a current member of the city council and a Rotarian. Uh, and our uh, audience questions are being fielded by Kim Bent, who is the president of the Rotary Club this year uh, and with the Lost Nation Theater. So without further ado, uh, I'll introduce Cassandra Hemingway, who will welcome our candidates. Thank you, Joe. Good. Hello, everybody. Thank you, candidates, for being here. Thank you to the Rotary Club for sponsoring this event. I'm Cassandra Hemingway, the managing editor of The Bridge. And um, this forum today is designed to give candidates the opportunity to share their views and explain why they think they should be elected. It is not a debate, so they won't be questioning each other. And before introducing candidates, I'll go over our format. We've asked the public to send in questions in advance, and we've used those questions to help develop the list that we're about to ask folks. We also are inviting questions from the audience who's here today, and um, we will um, be getting to those later in the program. Um, we are asking people, if you have a question, to write it down, give it to Kim, who's um, standing up in the back. Um, please put your name down when you ask a question, um, so we can, we can give you credit. Um, we'll get in as many questions as we can fit. Um, and the candidates have not been given any questions in advance. Each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves and make their opening remarks. And after that, they'll have 90 seconds or a minute and a half to answer each of the qu following questions. And then another minute and a half for their closing statements. The moderator has the discretion to make adjustments if needed. Um, we, uh, we talked about our timekeeper. Um, and for opening statements, um, I'm going to call on candidates um, in a kind of an interesting way. We're going to start with uh, semi-alphabetical order, but in the middle we are going to cluster. We have three candidates who are all running for the same seat, um, so we will identify them. Um, and the rest of the candidates are running. What, Sal Alfano is running um, against another candidate, Merrick Moden, who can't be here today, um, and Palin Khan is running unopposed. So, um, so I will identify those who are um, in a contested race with every question so folks can compare their answers. Um, okay, so I'm gonna introduce each of you and then, um, and then we'll start um, hearing your opening remarks. We have going around the table, Zach Hughes running for District 3, Tom Abdelnour running for District 3, Sal Alfano running for District 2 seat, and Palin Khan running for a different District 2 seat. So although they are both running for District 2, they are not running against each other. And Tim Heaney also running um, opposite of Tom and Zach for the District 3 seat on City Council. Um, so Zach, why don't you start us with your opening remarks? Thank you. I'm Zachary Hughes. Um I uh, live in, in the Prospect Street neighborhood of District 3 in Montpelier. I've been a Montpelier resident since 1991. Um, and I want to thank the invitation of uh, the folks at the bridge and the uh, Rotary for being here this afternoon as I am a write-in candidate. Um, and my, my position right now is that I I want to see um, more investment and less talk in certain areas inside the city, particularly concerning infrastructure, housing, and so on. And I believe I can bring the energy into that. I uh, also uh, do a lot of work in social ser services, and I would like the council to be represented for someone who is out there on a daily basis and sees what's going on. And I also see this as an opportunity to uh, elevate accessibility on the council as well. My, my, um, my hope is, you know, in this run and any future runs to promote all this. And I thank you. 
Thank you, Zach. Um, the next person we'll ask to speak is Tom Abdelnor, and I just want to apologize to the candidates because I'm way off of the originally planned order, but we're we're going to do District 3 candidates and then District 2 candidates. So Tom Abdenor is running opposite of Zach and Tim. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Thank you to the bridge and to the Rotary for putting on this event. Um, I'm the progressive candidate in this race. Um, I'm running to serve on the council in a way that hopefully will be an extension of what I've devoted my entire professional career toward which is standing up for working families and giving a voice to folks who have not traditionally had a voice in politics. Um, a quick background on myself for folks who may not be familiar with me. Um, I'm originally from the Northeast Kingdom, but I moved to Montpelier six years ago. I work for the Vermont State Employees Association, and in that role I fight at the State House every day to ensure that these workers are getting the benefits, the pay, and are safe on their job uh, in the way that they deserve to be treated. Um, my background before moving to Montpelier uh, was work in the office of Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, work on President Obama's reelection campaign, and work for Senator Cory Booker uh, in the state of New Jersey. And while I was excited to do all of those uh, take all of those opportunities after I left law school, I did miss my home state, and was happy to be able to move back to to my home state and move to this beautiful city of Montpelier. Uh, my goal is to make sure that the ability to live in Montpelier, work in Montpelier, build families in Montpelier, and build careers in Montpelier is something that more young folks like myself can take advantage of, that they're able to afford to be here. I think it's crucial that Montpelier not just be a playground for the rich, but it's a working, thriving community that we can all enjoy. Part of that as well, and I'll speak to this in a moment later as well, is just making sure that seniors have the ability to stay in our community. Montpelier should not be a place where folks are having to leave because of an affordability crisis, and I, that'll be at the core of what I'm doing if I'm lucky enough to be on the council. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Tom. And uh, Tim Heaney, also running for the same seat in District 3. Okay. I'm Tim Heaney. Um, grew up in Montpelier with my nine siblings and um, went all the way to Burlington, the UVM, got a degree in economics, the University of Vermont, uh, and came back and had the great privilege in life of being able to work with my dad for 16 years, which was really kind of a, was a great thing. Um, my career in real estate brokerage has been interesting for a small town um, practice. Uh, we've created a fair amount of housing uh, since I joined my dad in 81, uh, including uh, helped him with the Independence Green Freedom Drive neighborhood. Um, and uh, we did North Park Drive. That was a, a neighborhood over near Harvard Park, part of that project. Um, my parents donated 51 acres to the park, which was a significant uh, piece to help that the park grow. Uh, I've also been involved in other housing projects, creating single homes, mm -hmm. a project in Berlin at Mansfield Lane. Um, so I have a lot of experience in housing, and I know housing right now is a key need in Montpelier, so um, I'm feeling like I, it's a great time that I can contribute to the city council and, on housing issues. I also share the infrastructure concerns and questions. Um, infrastructure is, it's an old city, and we have a lot of old infrastructure, and the challenge is how to, how to bring it back up and make it all work. So um, Montpelier City Council is a, you know, it's a nonpartisan uh, local board. Um, I think, uh, you know, focusing on local issues of assisting with management of, of city's operations. So uh, I think the life of experience here, I can really help with that and look forward to doing it. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Um, Sal, now the two District 2 candidates, I'm going to um, uh, reach out to you in alphabetical order. So Sal Alfano running for District 2. Thanks, uh, Cassandra. Um, I am um, a current resident of Montpelier. I've lived over on McKinley Street for five years, uh, but I have about a 50-year, a little more than a 50-year connection. I uh, came here in 69 to go to school, fell in love with Vermont and with the woman who eventually became my wife. Uh, we spent almost 30 years in East Calais, raised a couple of kids, and then my job took us to Washington, D.C. And the first chance we had to get back was 2017, and we didn't think twice about that. Um, serving on the, the council has not been a lifelong dream of mine. I was re really recruited by my neighbors, um, but the, the issues are engaging to me. Um, I. Uh, worked my way through college as a carpenter, eventually ran a construction company in the 70s and 80s, and started writing uh, for magazines aimed at 
uh, general contractors in the, in the uh, professional housing industry, uh, residential mainly. And that job is what took me to Washington, D.C., where I, uh, I was the editorial director of about a half a dozen magazines aimed at uh, that audience. Um, so, you know, I have, I have experience that I think can contribute to the issues that we're struggling with. Uh, the housing issue really attracted my attention, beginning with, the, with really the, uh, the decision on the country club, uh, country club road. Um, and I just think that um, I'm the kind of person who, who does my homework. Uh, I'm thoughtful about issues. I have experience in business. I have experience with budgets, managing projects and people. Um, and I think I can contribute positively to uh, solving some of the issues that the council will face in the next year. Thank you, Sal. Now, Palin Khan is also running for District 2, but a um, just correct me if I'm wrong, Sal, you are running for a one-year seat, right. and Palin is running for the two-year seat. Um, so uh, both of them will be appear on the ballot separately, and Palin is currently serving on city council. Thank you, Cassandra, and <clears throat> thank you for Bridge, uh, Rotary, Donna, <coughs> and Orca Media uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I uh, moved uh, to Montpelier in 2017 from Turkey. Six years ago, I came here leaving everything behind. And when I say everything, really, I mean everything. And uh, I celebrate my 40 uh, years old birthday here. And when I uh, blow the uh, candles, I had only one wish, luck to myself, because I had to restart everything from scratch. And I thought, how can I do this? And I start volunteering, because I just want to be part of uh, Montpelier community. Uh, while I'm volunteering, I learned a lot of things, uh, lots of issues. Then in December 16, I was appointed uh, to the city council, and I've started public gatherings, listening sessions, and so far I organized two of them, and I'm planning to do more after the election. And in city council meetings, this listening session, I kept hearing same very, very three important issues, infrastructure, affordable housing, and renewable energy. And because of my background being immigrant, and I, when I talk to people, it comes up, right? And, oh, why can't we have a more diverse Montpelier? What can I do about it? So I am running uh, to make a difference in these issues. And also, uh, I'm already doing, but I'm ready to listen more people and try to be their voice at the city council. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's dive in. We're going to start by talking about budgeting. Um, that's something I'm sure everybody on City Council hears about. Um, citizens will be voting on March 7th. Among Besides for uh, the City Council seats, they'll be voting on a nearly $11.5 million city budget for fiscal year 24. Um, and that budget raised property taxes 7.6%. Given the many priorities reflected in the city budget, please describe how you plan to control and prioritize spending. And we will start with Sal. Um, I'm, I'm a, the, the kind of budgets that I had it to do were um, basically year over year budgets. So it was use it or lose it, um, which is not an approach that I particularly endorse. I, I prefer a sort of zero, zero budgeting where you start from scratch and take a look at what you need and uh, how much you can raise and then make the, make the choices that come from that. Um, in, in our case, um, I too have heard, like others, um, from uh, the, the residents of Montpelier as I've been campaigning and, and prior to that actually, uh, about uh, the infrastructure and the housing issues especially. And um, I think we, we're we gonna face some very difficult choices. I know we face them every year, but um, I think we're, we're kind of at a tipping point. And uh, it seems to me that we need to, to make a choice, choices this year between uh, things that we must have and things that it would be nice to have. And those are difficult decisions because we've been able to 
to get a lot of stuff that is nice to have in recent years, but I think we're at a point where we really have to um, hunker down and, and make a tough choice. Thank you, Sal. Tom. Thanks, Cassandra. <clears throat> when I've been out um, knocking folks' doors, speaking with folks throughout the community, um, I have heard a resounding response in terms of what is it that folks really want the council to be focused on. And that, at this stage, and given the constraints that you described, really focuses on the bread and butter infrastructural issues, housing issues that our community faces, right? Um, I think that we have to be able to prioritize, and I mean, I'll just say I live on School Street. Um, School Street at the moment is a bit of an infrastructural nightmare. Um, in addition to all of the well-publicized water issues we've had, um, at the moment on School Street, there is a pothole there that, as I said the other night, I think could easily swallow a VW Beetle at the moment, right? So we're, we're dealing with massive, ongoing, serious infrastructural issues, and we're dealing with making sure that we have a community that's able to accommodate the folks that we want to be a part of it. And I think that's really key. We need to be budgeting in such a way and spending our resources in such a way that we're going to be building up our housing stock, right? Because as we've seen, people are already feeling the pinch from our current budget, and the only way we're going to keep taxes low while meeting our priorities is to raise that housing stock, and I'm sure we'll have more questions to talk about housing. We certainly will. Tim, um, and just to back up a little bit, um, Sal was answering from District 2, Tom running for District 3, Tim running for District 3. Yes, so budgeting, it's a marathon process every year, and I've watched it from the sidelines, so I think elected it'll be interesting to get more detail. It, Montpelier is interesting because with the increases we've got that apparently are aligned with inflation, I don't think people's incomes have necessarily increased at the same levels, and a lot of other pieces in their lives have gone up at greater levels than that, like heating costs for their homes or apartments. And um, So I, I, I think we are a tipping point with very high annual percentages of increase, even though it's in line with inflation. Um, I, I think it's it, it's difficult for folks. Um, I think another piece that's important in the budget process is that we use the term priorities in Montpelier rather loosely. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes I feel like everything's a priority, which means nothing's a priority. And we really need to find a way to focus on what's important to us and to focus our resources toward you know, infrastructure. I think we can create more housing and also improve infrastructure. They're not musically, mutually exclusive. Um, I think we can also still <coughs> manage our social programs that we need to. So I'm feeling the budget process will be an interesting learning experience. And um, it, it's, it's just going to be an interesting piece to, to, to learn as we go through. Thanks. Thank you. Zach. <laughs> For well, District I, three. I think everyone sitting at this table can agree that, uh, on all this, pretty much. And I, I just, um, it's a challenging process. I've also sat on the sidelines like Tim and others here. And, uh, you know, I, I was moved by a constituent in District 3 who was frustrated at the water rates being raised. And, uh, you know, it got to me. Um, you know, and I, I'm looking forward to a process, too, and I think there are going to need to be a discussion of priorities. I think for too long we've kind of bounced things around a little bit and tried to do things, you know, let's bounce it over here. And But I, I would be challenging, well, the city, uh, I would say we need to invest in uh, something like, a re you know, more restrooms. Uh, that's one thing, you know. I. I look at it from a tourist point of view, uh, from a general public point of view, I'm not looking at it from the homeless point, even though I am on the homeless task force, but that bugs me. Um, and I did see, you know, a promising investment, which will come out of the restroom committee at some point. Um, but my, my issue here is we just need to look at the, the things that the city really needs and do the investment. Um, and we're gonna have, you're right, we're gonna have hard decisions. Um, and it's, you know, for me, when I hear a constituent say, I can't afford to live here anymore, it really gets to me. Because you should be able to live here, you know. And so, for me, I would want to 
look jointly with a list of priorities or whatever and really have a discussion and not say, well, someone else can do that. That's time, Zach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Palin. Um, I agree most of the things um, other candidates mentioned. And I just want to point out that uh, we have a specific amount of people who live here, which means that we have a specific amount of budget this year, and we will have the specific amount of budget for every year, which means that focusing on our needs as a um, community should be the first. Then we should move to our um, visionary ideas, which we have a lot, and we have to have them. And also, the thing is we want to improve our community. So we have a, since we have a specific amount of um, budget, we, we should focus on uh, the needs and also their hidden costs. Uh, then we can uh, start creating more things for our uh, community. Thank you. Thank you. So another fairly um, uh, big topic in our city is homelessness. Uh, at last count, there are approximately 450 individuals who are houseless in central Vermont, um, and several dozen of them regularly in our city. Um, there are controversies in town around some of uh, you know where folks are panhandling, things like the restrooms that Zach brought up, um, elevated numbers of police calls, and of course you know concern for people. What do you think the city's role is in addressing homelessness? And we will start with Tom uh, running for District Three. Thanks, Cassandra. Um, <clears throat> My concern for folks in the unhoused community is huge, and I think there, that is a sentiment that's widely shared throughout this room and for folks watching today. Um, I think the key to addressing this question is going to be how can we best leverage our resources as a city while also f really making sure that folks at the state level are meeting their responsibilities to Montpelier, because this is not an issue that can simply be a city issue. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. As we've discussed so far, Representative Connor Casey and Representative Kate McCann have currently sponsored a bill that's before the legislature right now that would provide a public restroom in the Capitol complex. Um, I sit regularly as a part of my role of working for the Vermont State Employees Association as their legislative coordinator in the Corrections and Institutions Committee, which is the committee that has that bill uh, within it. And I've spoken to community activists about their support of this bill. In order to get these things done, we're gonna have to partner between the legislature and the city in order to really jointly advance these projects. I'm working very closely with Representative Casey on his advocacy for this bill, and I feel honored that both he and Representative Kate McCann have endorsed my candidacy. It's in part because of my ability, they believe, to get issues like this across the finish line. We all have the goodwill to do it. It's about using expertise and know-how to actually get it done, and it'll be a top priority of mine if I'm on the council. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, let's see. Tim, also running for District 3. And housed issue is a big challenge, and part of the reason it's such a giant challenge is there's so many people that they're impacted by it for so many different reasons. There's not one solution, and, and so anyway, I think as we step into it and try to get our arms around it and, and understand what we can do best, it feels like at least a few concrete steps. I think Montpelier is trying. Um, and communities around us are. I think Good Samaritan Haven is an amer amazing resource and they do so much work um, and it does it another way. And there's just, it, we have good people here that are on it and churches are helping, but it feels like we need to do more. I think the public restrooms, as Zach mentioned, are a key element just to human dignity that we need in this town. It's something we can do and we just, it's a concrete step, we should just do it. We have some at the Transit Center already, Connor Casey and Kate are working on some. The key is getting them and then budgeting and finding a way to fund taking care of them, managing these spaces so that they can be safe and work and be clean. 
So I, I think that's where I would start. And then the shelter side of it, um, Montpelier does not have a shelter. Other communities around us, like Good Samaritan Havens and Barrie, Twin City Motel. So I think we need to look at maybe an option for shelter in our community as well. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, sorry, I lost track of, <laughs> did, did I, did you answer this question, Zach? I think you're next on those. Zach running for District 3. I just want to invite the candidates to come to uh, the Homelessness Task Force at any given time. They meet on a regular basis. We have a meeting this Wednesday. Um, so I just want to lay that out. Uh, my, um, my first thing would be, I'm just going to throw it out there because I'm a go-getter and I want to do this. So the bathroom, uh, we need to invest. Uh, we're talking about $250,000 possible investment for the city. It would be a Portland loop in the city. And while I appreciate Connor Casey's bill, it also contains a study provision. We got to do it, folks. I don't have time for a study. I'm just going to lay it out there. Um, and, you know, we need to work together on homelessness as well. I, I don't think it's just a Montpelier issue. And later this in a couple months, I will be bringing together providers to figure out what we're going to do next winter because we're in the winter still, but. Yeah, we still got to work on this, and we're doing uh, great work. So thank you. Thank you, Zach. Palin, running for District 2. Thank you. Um, like Zach suggested, I attended uh, Homeless Task Force, uh, one of the public forums, and there are so many things we are not aware of this issue. One thing, what I learned from that session, I could say that homelessness is not an issue that people don't have. Uh, buildings to live. There are so many other uh, issues created this problem, like mental health issues, social issues, psychological issues, employment, so many things. That's why it, it is really, it is like a um, um, iceberg, right? We only see people mm -hmm. outside the streets, but down, uh, deep down, there are so many things that we should do and we should uh, solve as a community, which means that city should collaborate more with experts, with other um, NGOs or as associations who, uh, which are already doing this job. Then we can create our plan. Now, as far as I observe, we are only talking about creating more buildings, but it is just uh, tip of the iceberg of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Sal, running for District 2. One year term. Yeah. One year term. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I agree with every, everything everyone has said. Um, I, I'm looking for things to add, and I, I think maybe I have one or two, but uh, I, I think it uh, uh, people experiencing um, homelessness um, are there be for a, a, a wide variety of reasons, and and we can't address them all alone. I think we we really need to to ask. I think first of all the the agencies and the people and the committees uh, that are actively dealing with the problem what they what they need most, and and then see how much of that we can provide. But but as a city, we, I think we can only do so much. Um, I think we we need to cooperate with the with state government as well. I think um, together we we need to solve that problem. I I agree that uh, that housing isn't the uh, only solution. There's a there's a lot that that needs to be uh, dealt with. But I think housing um, any housing plan that we come up with should address uh, housing the homeless. Uh, sort of a housing first approach which has been successful in a lot of places, um, has to be done correctly, but uh, it, it sets the groundwork and the foundation for all of the other services that you provide. So that's a good place to start, I think. Thank you, and that's a perfect seg to the next question, which is about housing. Um, all, uh, all, all the folks running for local office have pointed to housing as a pressing local issue. 
um, lack of it and lack of affordable housing. How will you use your position on city council to address the growing housing crisis? And we will start with Tim running for District 3. Okay. So housing at the moment in Montpelier, there are a number of exciting projects at different places along the way um, trying to happen. So, uh, and I, people are probably familiar with, there's a couple on Northfield Street, including Habitat for Humanity has one. Um, the Stonewall Meadows project seems like it's pretty well along and that, that could be coming online soon. Um, the Age of Zorzi property, uh, Doug Zorzi and Alan Goldman, I think have ideas for that property. and. And of course, the Country Club Road property that the city recently acquired is a big conversation point for housing. So being a member of the city council with all these projects happening, it will be, uh, I think any of our role if we're there is just to support, to make sure the conversations happen. Um, it happens at a lot of different levels at DRB and other levels that's not city council. So we won't be necessarily at the hearings uh, for these projects as they happen, but we can provide support. I think for any of them to happen, that I, I, virtually every one of them, there's gonna be infrastructure that's needed. And I think part of our role on the council will be to know, to be there to talk about how do we get the water and sewer lines to those areas um, and utilities so that this housing can happen and our community can grow. Thank you, Tim. Um, Zach, running for District 3. Um. I, I still think it's going to take, uh, you know, how would I use my position? It's, it's a collaborative approach with others. Um, and we do, we do have projects in the pipeline, as pointed out, and there are more coming online throughout, you know. And so I think it would be a collaborative, I've always said it's a collaborative process, because um, you can't do this alone, you know, and, and, uh, you know, the more we have for, I mean, you can have a house, but you have to have more with it. And, uh, and I am impressed with some of these projects we've been able to complete, um, certainly, and I'm looking forward to more. But I think it's a collaborative effort um, from everybody, including the voters. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Palin, running for District 2, two-year term. So my approach would be first having current and trustworthy data. So when we were listening to Elle's uh, land uh, country club project, I asked <laughs> the same thing um, uh, to those group who made the presentation. By the way, they did a great job. So what are the numbers for you know how much? Uh, how we want to have right, and how much this project will solve? that housing. So I've tried to research, I couldn't find any data. Uh, for this issue, I think we need to work uh, through numbers. Then it will give us a clear vision what we want to uh, achieve. And I also checked um, um, like a projection on Montpelier and how the living will be here. And the uh, report is on the city's website. And there is an item, net new jobs. And apparently this projection says that 2025, uh, Montpelier will have 11,204 uh, net new jobs, which means I think that much people coming. Can you repeat that number? 11,204. It mm -hmm. says net new jobs. So that's why we have to combine these different numbers and we have to first uh, know how many houses we need and how many people are looking for uh, uh, those housing opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Sal, running for District 2, one year seat. Um, yes, I, I agree that it would be uh, essential to know to know where, where the numbers are on, on housing and what the projections are for population and how that relates to revenue and so on. Um, but it's pretty clear that we have a supply demand problem. I think that what, that's what drives the key issue, which for me is the affordability element. I think people throw around the term affordability in a sort of simplistic way. For me, it means um, 
it means not only uh, first, first owner or first renter affordability, but perpetual affordability. Um, and that, that is a trickier thing to, to pull off than simply building something that, that a first buyer or a first renter can afford. Um, I also think that the operational cost is something that needs to be factored in. Um, I, I read something on Front Porch today about somebody who put in uh, a heat pump and was disappointed that their electric bill was like three or four times what it should have been. And that I'm almost convinced without knowing the person that it's because their house isn't very well insulated. I mean, you, you can't do one without the other. And so if we're gonna build an affordable housing unit wherever we build it in the city, we need to keep in mind that uh, the people who own it and live there or rent it and live there are gonna have to pay monthly operational costs. So we need to build it to a very high standard, which of course is more expensive and makes it even more challenging. Thank you. Tom Abdelnour, running for District 3. Thanks, Cassandra. <clears throat> so as I said, when I moved back to my home state of Vermont and when I moved to Montpelier, um, I would have loved to have become a homeowner, but I just couldn't afford it, right? So for now, I rent. And the reason I rent is, to be, fl to be blunt, at the moment, the real estate market, the prices in the real estate market in Montpelier are out of control. So I think in order to address the housing crisis we find ourselves in, we need to be addressing it in a holistic way that looks all the way through the range of housing that we hope to build. It's going to deal with addressing the issue of our unhoused population, as you spoke about before, Cassandra. It's going to deal with allowing renters to have attaining home ownership in Montpelier be a realistic prospect to build families here, to stay here, to build their careers here. Um, and we've spoken about some good ideas. There have been some great work done by organizations like Downstreet and VHCB, and, and there have been some intriguing projects. There is one thing I, I think um, is perhaps an untapped resource that we should look into. So um, the state of Vermont right now has seen a huge portion of its Montpelier workforce transition to working from home and, and telecommuting. Right? That means there are these huge unused spaces of state-owned property within the city that we really have to explore utilizing for our own housing needs. And I think this is, again, another, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record on this. It's an issue that's going to require collaboration between the folks in state government and the folks in city government. And so I think we really need to partner with the state and make sure that it's meeting its responsibility to us as the capital of the state of Vermont. And we're using that resource to address this problem. Thank you. Um, I have this fancy chart to make sure I got everybody, but I'm not, did everybody answer that question? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so related to housing, I want to talk about the city's purchase of the former Elks Club on Country Club Road. It's now being called the Country Club Road property. <coughs> um, and this question comes from Nat Winthrop. Um, he, we have several of these questions came from the public who emailed them in to us. And he asks, uh, and this multi, just warning, it's a multi-part question. Whether or not you supported last March's bond to purchase the former Elks Club property, do you favor building affordable housing there? And do you see that property having potential to be a legacy for future generations? If so, in what sense? And if not, do you favor reselling the property? <coughs> and I realize it's multi-part, so I can ask it again as, as we go through. Um, so we're going to start with Zach running for District 3. Um, yeah, um, if you could, I don't know if you could ask this. I'll ask it again. It, it's a complicated much. question. Uh, the, the bottom line is, um, okay. do you favor building affordable housing on the city-owned Country Club Road property? And, um, and do you see that property <coughs> having potential to be a legacy <coughs> for future generations? I see the property being a legacy for future generations. I do not favor reselling the property because it has potential to it, um, which will again require some uh, collaborative efforts with the community and get there, continue to get their input. <clears throat> um, I don't think, uh, you know, I think um, if housing is, is a thing that we can need to do on that property, I would certainly be in favor of it. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the rec center being moved up into there because of accessibility, which is a platform 
in my uh, campaign right now. Um, so I just want to lay that out. But I, I'm in favor of, as I said, the legacy and not selling it. Uh, selling, the, not reselling the property. Why would we do that? Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Sorry. Palin, running for District 2, two-year seat. Thank you. So after listening to uh, the uh, presentation uh, of this project and also checking the um, all the reports, um, they um, the you know project um, sh um, shows us three different plants, and I am more like uh, having both housing and recreation center. So they call it like test, right? Test A, test right. B, test C. So it sounds more uh, um, better approach for our needs as a community. But again, in that uh, night, I asked the same question. Do you have any statistic? When we build housing houses here, will we be able to provide affordable housing? Will we be able to solve you know, housing issue? There was... Um, no specific answer for that. That's why first we need to really, really create a very specific budget because every day when we start talking about this project, somehow all the hidden costs may uh, make the budget higher. So we should be careful about it. And for the reselling or keeping it, I will go and listen to uh, District 2 people because my job as a city councilor and I think all city councilors' job to represent our um, district people's perspective uh, and bring those perspectives to the city council. So whatever uh, they want me to bring to city council, I will do that. Uh, yeah, but for me, very clear budget, very specific budget is important uh, to decide to do anything with it. Thank you. Thank you. Sal, running for District 2, one-year seat. Uh, <clears throat> I did support the purchase of uh, the Oaks Club property, um, although I must say that at the, at the time I was thinking of it mainly as a site for recreation, which is how it was initially presented. Um, my understanding was that the rec committee was kind of at its wits, wits end trying to find an alternative. The Oaks Club was perfect um, because of the open space, the existing building, and so on. Um, <clears throat> when housing was added to it, it significantly complicated the process, and we're now involved in a planning process um, that is likely to take quite some time. Um, but I think we, we absolutely need, need to do that. Um, what what worries me, though, is that I th I, th I mean we have we need housing soon, and uh, I don't think we're going to get it soon at the Elks Club, no matter what our plan is. It, there's infrastructure has to be built long before we can break ground on a house. Um, and I'm, I'm worried that, um, that w we, we will uh, compromise funds that we need to take care of, of infrastructure and housing that's available in other places, such as downtown and s some of the other projects that have been suggested. Uh, so that, that's a big concern of mine, and I, I worry that, that people think that we have a um, – a, a sort of miracle solution for housing on that on that property. It can be a legacy, but it's going to take a long time for that to happen. Thank you. Tom, running for District 3. Thanks, Cassandra. <clears throat> I think the question within it contains something that I think is an important thing for us all to consider when we're thinking about this issue. It said, regardless of your position, right? I think there are a huge diversity of views that have been on this issue from people throughout the community and people felt very strongly about it at the time. I think also, though, that we are where we are now. We do own the land, and I think it's now time to make the best of it. Um, I will say with regard to recreation, um, I do think that pouring up to $3 million into an antiquated rec facility is not the way to go. I think we should look for other uses for that space and um, see how we can best address recreation uh, at, this, at this property. And I do think that it's essential that we, in any housing that goes on there, are, are presenting a group of housing projects that are um, of mixed income, right? 
So we're having rental properties, we're having condominiums, we're having a, a range of housing options that are available and anything we do there. And I don't, I don't think that the Country Club Road property is the silver bullet to addressing our uh, needs with housing. I don't think any one project will be, but I do think that it's very possible that it could be a key component of, of a broader strategy moving forward using all of these different strategies that we've talked about so far. So I think we need to make the best of it now that we have it. Thank you. Okay, um, Tim. Yes. So the Country Club Road property is, like with Sal, uh, one of the reasons I decided to run for city council. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting process to watch. Um, it wasn't a priority for the community, but it's come in now. We own it. it bumped ahead of a few other things, it seems. Um, and it's an, a neat challenge. Um, I think it's a property that, it's, it's a beautiful property. It's an amazing asset. It will be a legacy for Montpelier without any doubt. Um, the opportunity to create housing there, I think, is one we can't miss. It's, it's, a, it's a big piece of land. There's plenty of room for recreation and for housing there. And um, I, I, the key is we haven't done our homework yet. We haven't, you know, usually in this process it would have happened sooner. People would have done the engineering, done assessments of what's it going to take to get the utilities there. Is, is this street going to handle housing and if, or, or just general uses? How much traffic will Country Club Road take? Um, or do we have to make other accommodations? So there's a lot to know that we don't know yet. And watching the public process happening, it seems a little bit early without having that data to give kind of guardrails for what needs to happen. Um, Montpelier also needs to do master planning and that's evident with this country club process. So I'd like to talk more about that later. Thanks. Thank you. So this is maybe a good segue to talk about infrastructure a little bit. Um, you, Tom, you mentioned School Street, um, which uh, was the site of one of several water main breaks in the past year. Um, I think everyone here is probably aware there's the city has a 50 year plan where it's gradually increasing water and sewer rates to help um, fund replacement of water mains. Should the city spend more in the future than it has been up till now on replacing water main pipes and street repairs? And for this question, we're gonna start with Palin. Thank you. If our budget allows, yes, definitely because it is the most important need of our town. Um, that's why we have to make it our priority. Uh, but again, when, um, as a city, we decide our annual budget, there are so many things uh, we have to uh, consider as a community. And uh, we should make infrastructure one of the top issue, then plan others um, issues accordingly because every time whoever I talk to they always tell the same thing our streets potholes and I couple times I raised this um, request at the City Council to please you know say this when will our streets be repaired how can I uh, learn uh, you know is there any plan that I can find out yeah it is our one <laughs> maybe for a long time only um, um, a priority. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Sal, running for District 2. Um, I think uh, if we can afford to, yes, we, we, should, we should try to catch up. I, I'm not sure exactly how, how it happened or, or even exactly what happened, but I, we seem to have fallen behind um, on the uh, on the infrastructure um, plan. I think the pandemic had something to do with it, and I think even though the, the ARPA money, we used ARPA money to replace, um, to, to replace that, we, we, lost, we lost a year or more j just of ac activity uh, that we haven't been able to, to make up. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's a problem that I've heard from almost everybody I've talked to. Uh, I mean, you know, I live on McKinley, so I make that, that crazy crack back turn up from Barry Street up onto Sibley a couple of times a day, and there's a pothole there the size of a beach ball right where my right front tire hits. That's the kind of thing that when somebody encounters that every day, they don't care. 
They just want the road fixed. So we've, we've reached a point where, I mean, it's, we're, we're not yet at torches and pitchforks, but people are upset about the infrastructure. I think we need to do uh, reshuffle things if we, if we have to, to find a way um, to fix the, the worst of it, uh, and then um, let people know what the, what the long-term plan is so they can be patient about it. Thank you. Tom, running for District 3. Thanks so much, Cassandra. Uh, as you said earlier, as somebody who lives on School Street, this is an issue that quite literally hits close to home. Um, and I would just say, I, I think an essential part of addressing our infrastructure needs has got to be that we have got to stop playing catch up, right? I think we are going to be throwing good money after bad if we are not making a significant investment to address this issue and get ahead of it a little bit so that we're not constantly responding to one crisis after another. Um, I think uh, a component of that too is, gotta be, is going to be that although we have unlimited goodwill to address these issues and we have a certain budget amount that's there to address these issues, Part of it is making sure that we have the staff to address these issues. Folks will know that the contract has recently been reopened there, but I think we've got to make sure that the city of Montpelier, when it comes to recruiting folks, skilled folks, we're going to be able to do this work, has to be an employer of choice, right? Because we're not going to be able to recruit the folks we need to address our infrastructure issues, to address public safety, uh, unless we're a competitive employer. I'll say very quickly too, because I see I'm running out of time, My role model in terms of addressing municipal government issues when it comes to infrastructure is my old boss, Cory Booker. He became famous for when folks said to him, Mayor, there's a pothole on my street. It's been here for three weeks. He would call a truck, and he and the truck would go down, and they'd fill the pothole. That's the level of responsiveness that I aspire to, because we have these conversations again and again about infrastructure, but we don't always see the follow through. That's going to be my approach. Thank you. Tim, running for District 3. It's going to be Zachariah, right? All right. <laughs> so infrastructure, it is, it's the topic everywhere we go in Montpelier. And it was actually really great at the mayoral forum a few minutes ago hearing um, Jack McCullough talk about uh, the water treatment plant bond coming up soon and that the funds that are currently being used to pay that bond will be available uh, for more infrastructure projects coming up shortly. That was really great news to me, and I, it was nice to learn that. But I think we do need to do more infrastructure investment. Um, we do have an amazing public works team, and um, I, I think we certainly don't have to have the staff on board to do all these projects. We, we can hire contractors, and our public works people can oversee that. Much like the School Street project when they did the water line this winter, um, they brought in a private contractor. Uh, but I, I think th there's just so much to do. We need a plan. And, and it's, we need to work smart with this. I know an example, a friend of mine said he was actually talking to the guys in the hole this winter with the water line, mm -hmm. replacing this little piece of pipe. And one of the people working on it said, yeah, for what it's costing to replace this little couple foot piece of pipe, we could probably have replaced it from here all the way to the corner. Uh, but when we're doing these yeah. emergency repairs all the time, we're paying premium prices mm -hmm. and uh, it's not the best value. So having a good plan and getting ahead of it's important. Thank you. Zach. All right. So what do you, what do people value? Let's get down to it. We're going to have to uh, invest in this because if we don't invest in it for each one of these pressure issues or broken pipes, we're going to be paying for it in the end. We need to invest, and I We'll say this, and I will also ask uh, if uh, Cory Brooker can come and, and put a little patch uh, on School Avenue, a big patch. Um, it's, it's, but it's exactly that. It's a patch. It's not a, um, yeah, potholes are potholes. This is really about investment in this city, and uh, I think we can all agree with it, and I'm ready to go with it. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. I'm going to go back to a budget question because when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about how it's going to be funded, and ultimately, a lot of that funding comes from the citizens. Um, so, the city polled citizens in an online survey this year 
uh, prior to its budgeting <laughs> process and found that more than half <laughs> of the respondents do not support raising taxes. And there was another 25% from a different question that also want to see some city departments being cut. Comments from the survey, and there was, I went through every single one of them and read them all, um, and there was, I, I can't remember, I won't say the number <laughs> now, but comments from the survey spoke about how people are hurting financially and saying they cannot take more increases in property taxes. There was a person recently who voted, who posted on Front Porch Forum that she described herself as, quote, 77 years old, retired, lived here for 45 years, never was rich, not rich now. The yearly increases in Montpelier are getting really difficult. I'm sure you've all heard that. Um, given all of that information, will you work toward developing city budgets that contain or reduce property taxes given that there's also a pressing infrastructure needs. Um, so I realize that's a little bit of a repeat of our first question, but I really want to get to this question of affordability for for taxpayers in town. And um, we're going to start with Palin again for this one. So if we talk about affordability, we cannot keep increasing the property tax because I'm a like a salary person, right? My salary, my annual income doesn't go up that much. So I understand and I, again, when I talk to people, I hear this all the time. Uh, we need to find other funds. Uh, my suggestion would be a focus on um, developing economic um, um, opportunities. Uh, because again, the same report, um, it's talk about economics and livelihood of uh, Montpelier. It says Montpelier is a great place for green jobs and creative economy. So we have lots of different committees, city committees. As far as I know, there is none uh, about economic development. We have Montpelier alive, but not a city committee. So we don't work with experts, right? Maybe. Uh, one way uh, not to increase property tax, but find other ways to support uh, that uh, revenue uh, might be economic development of our downtown and um, city. Thank you. Thank you. Zach. Um, I, would, I would not want to um, raise taxes any more than um, I think that's a stretch. I think we have to do a couple of things that we're not going to like doing. Um, well, one thing we'll like to do, I think, and that's out of the box thinking. We're going to have to look for other things to other ways of funding. And uh, we need to also make some difficult choices. We can't have it all. I'm sorry to say that. It's really going to get down to this because, you know, while it was nice to and it's not nice when the tax go up, but these things cost money. So you're going to see me say no more uh, raise of property taxes if we can help it. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Tim? Yeah, I mean, the property tax or the general income and expense question for the whole city is it's, it's always a balancing act. And, and finding that balance is, is the toughest job for the city council. Uh, it seems like Montpelier voters have been very generous for a long time and tend to vote yes and trust their council and, and what's put before them. So I think it's incumbent on the council to really do the job and, and realize that <clears throat> things change. And this is an old organization, and it's one of those things where it's okay to occasionally review it and say, are we doing things the best way we can? Is this structured the best way it can to provide the services we need to our taxpayers at a price they can afford? And if we need to make adjustments in terms of staffing and reallotments or moving things around, we need that flexibility as a council and with the management team. So uh, I, I do think it's a key thing that we've got to get under control here. Um, and it, it's a big challenge, but uh, we can do it. Thank you. Tom. Thanks, Cassandra. I just want to start by saying that for folks like the person who submitted this question, seniors who are wondering, are they going to be able to stay in their homes? Young folks who are going to say, is this a place I can make a home for myself or am I going to have to leave this community? Those voices 
Those concerns are the primary reason I am running to be on the city council. We cannot <laughs> fail these city residents. It's got to be at the core of everything we're thinking about. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to addressing the affordability crisis that we find ourselves in, I will be privileging those folks' voices every day. That's, that's my sort of guiding star. Um, I will say that in order to get our hands around keeping property taxes lower, in order to get a hold on this affordability crisis, as I said before, we absolutely have to grow our housing stock, right? So the impact is not falling so intensely on each individual resident right now. We've got to share this more broadly, and we've got to go our housing sector that all of these questions are interrelated is what we were just talking about before, and it's a key factor in this question as well. I'll just say as well, this is another area where Montpelier cannot be going it alone. We cannot just have all of this burden falling on the city. The state needs to take an active hand. They need to get involved, and they need to help us address this crisis. And I'll tell you, that's going to be my mindset I'm taking when I'm trying to figure out how to make sure we're keeping Montpelier affordable for everyone. Thank you. Sal. Um, <clears throat> I have no quarrel with, with anything anybody has said here. I, I, I would add that I think um, the, uh, the economic development side of things um, is important, and I think one, one key to that is something we haven't talked about, but uh, child care is, is important um, to that. Uh, I, I happen to be involved in an, in an application process with National Life for a grant, and one of the reasons, one of, one of the things they were very interested in was childcare, because they, they normally have 800 employees, and they only have 700, and they cannot attract the other 100 because there's no place to live, and there's no childcare. Uh, unless we solve um, all of these problems together, even in a small way to start, we're going to get nowhere. There, there's too much interrelation um, among all of these things that we need to do. So we start with a zero budgeting process. Uh, I think budgeting to inflation doesn't really cut it. Um, not everybody's paycheck goes up every year the way inflation goes up. So we've got to we've got to look. I know that the, the council looks hard at the budget. We have to look harder. Uh, and, and the decisions are, are difficult. I think they're going to be even more difficult. But unless we make, make those the right choices, um, nothing's going to change. Thank you. I think we're uh, within a half an hour of um, finishing the forum. Did we have any new questions from the audience? I have a couple that um, we didn't get to in the mayoral forum that I thought I would uh, bring up now. Um, so this is a question that um, is about housing. So it's um, related to what we were just talking about. I'm, I'm going to say it how the person wrote it. And I think, and then, then if we need to clarify, we can clarify. Would you consider dedicating most or all of new housing to people working in the city or moving from other parts of Vermont? And I believe the question, the person who asked the question meant that as opposed to prioritizing people moving from out of state. So would you consider dedicating most or all of new housing to people who are already working in the city or moving from within Vermont? Um, I think, it, I don't know if I'm getting, the question asker is in the room. Am I getting at your meaning? Okay. So, um, and we'll start with Zach with this question. Um, well, I certainly would um, be open to uh, looking at that, but given that I don't have much uh, information to go on here right now, I don't have a real clear um, answer to it, but you can bet that we w I would collaborate uh, with others because this isn't about me. This is about you, the uh, citizen of Montpelier. So my answer may not sound clear, but believe me, we can, we'll collaborate and figure it out. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Palin. It's a good question. And I think we should start 
providing enough housing to our community members first. Then we are a very welcoming community. I know it from my personal experience. So we can move to incoming uh, people, like people who live in the city or coming from other places to our state, that maybe we can create um, two or three stage plan uh, about this. But we should first solve our community issues. Thank you. Thank you. About housing. Thanks. Sal. Um, I think it's a great idea. I, I don't know if it's legal to, <laughs> that was my question. to do that. Um, <laughs> so that, that would be the first step, is find out if it's legal. But if, you know, if it isn't, uh, I'm sure there are, other, there are other ways to get at the, at the issue. Um, uh, you can do it in reverse, I suppose. You, you, know, you can look at um, second homes and um, uh, Airbnb type stuff. You, you, can, you can regulate that in a way that, that might make it more attractive or let's say less attractive for people who aren't uh, living uh, or working in the, in the city. Um, but I think it, it certainly raises the issue of, of work, workforce housing. Um, I mean, I think people who work in the city ought to be able to live in the city. Um, there are lots of cities across the country. You know, we're not the only city that has this problem. Um, a, lot of, a lot of cities are wrestling with the fact that they're, um, you know, they're, they're service pros and uh, can't, can't afford to live in town. Um, that, that should be corrected in, in any way that we, that, that we can do it. Thank you. Tom? Thanks, Cassandra. I really appreciate the question. Um, I think I'm going to answer it in a, in a bit of a roundabout way and say that I think that given the current situation we find ourselves in, we are already in a situation where we're forced to address the needs of our community right now before we're able to be an attractive option for folks to relocate to, right? So if you're somebody who's from out of state, if you're somebody who's considering moving to Montpelier, you may not, you may see the state of our real estate market where the, real, the realty prices are out of control, where the rental market is a disaster, and that may prevent you right then and there from ever being able to take, make the decision to come and, and live in Montpelier. So I, I think that's not a place where we can afford to be as a community. As I've said, I think unless we grow this community and grow it in a way that's uh, providing affordable housing for folks. We're never going, where the burden is always gonna be higher on the folks who are here right now. Um, so we have to get a, our hands around this issue if we're even going to be attracting in folks from other places. Um, so yes, I think we have to be very, very concerned with how it is for folks here right now. But I also think that if we're gonna succeed and grow as a community and get the economic development uh, progress that we're all talking about here, get a revitalized community. We can't just look for the folks we have here right now. We have to be looking at folks out of state, new Americans, growing our refugee population that's here. We need to be drawing folks in. So I think it's both meeting our needs at home, but also being an attractive place for folks out of state. Thank you. Tim. It's a good question. And um, there are ways to do this. I mean, we can make a positive impact doing it. I, I, do kind of think about fair housing rules and, and how far we can go with some of the restrictions, but it would seem like it is legal to have income limits on housing, to create a housing with people up to a certain income can live there. Um, employers could be contributing to creating housing, so if National Life, Union Mutual, Vermont Mutual, Blue Cross, the city of Montpelier wanted to help create some workforce housing, they absolutely can do that and give a priority toward their employees to living there. There are ways to do this. and. Um, it's kind of exciting. It'd be fun to, to work on. Thank you. Okay, this question, uh, this person, also in the room, um, Tom is asking about um, on the ballot on, that we're all going to be voting on on March 7th. Um, the city, and I may be goofing up the language, so luckily we have a couple council members here who can help me. The city currently has bundled all of the requests from organizations for funding into, uh, I believe it's into the budget, um, rather than naming them one at a time. So the person is asking, why is it that when an organization wants money from the city, 
and to be on the ballot, why can't they be listed individually? Um, I'm not sure if that's a question you've considered as a candidate for city council. Um, they, they can be, but they have to be petitioned now. They have to petition now. So, for example, Kellogg Hubbard Library is listed individually because right, they, they petition. Can they go out? They have to be excused by the board. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not sure if if that's enough of an answer. We we can go around, and if you'd like to answer the question, go ahead. It might be one of those questions you know more about once you're already on the council. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take a stab at it, Cassandra, and just say that in general. Uh, I trust Montpelier voters, and I trust them to make good decisions when prevent, presented with individual choices. And so if there's a de demand from folks to be able to consider applications for funding one at a time and individually, that's something that I would have no problem supporting. I think we've talked today about the need to make sure we're adequately uh, pro making priorities, right? And I trust voters to do that. So if folks have a desire to be addressing those on a case-by-case -case issue, I'm, I would support that. Uh, Sal. Um, I would also support um, more individual listing of requests, um, even though it may, it may become cumbersome. Um, I, or, or either that or make the communication um, clearer about the, how the funds might be used when they're clumped together in an article. I found the article, I, I don't know which number it is, but the one that, that uh, includes co the money for Con Confluence Park. So, you know, the, the council voted to postpone that whole project, and then there it is in the article as part of the total amount. So it's confusing to people. I'm not saying it was the wrong thing to do. It's just there isn't enough explanation as to how that money might be spent, and is the 600 for Confluence in there or not, and what happens if we spend it? and. It raises a lot of questions that I think are accuse, uh, confusing to voters. And so uh, an individual item, yes or no, and, and, you, and you're done. So. And I just want to clarify, I believe the, the person is asking about outside organizations, not mm -hmm. city projects. So it might be a, so for yeah, example. Yeah, right. I, I, right. I think the same right. thing applies, though. Um, right. Really. Yeah. Um, Tim? I don't know. I think there was a lot of history around this issue, and I'm trying to remember it, and I'm not remembering. But it, it seems like I know there are some organizations that were part of the city's allowance or allotment for community fund, community mm -hmm. fund and then they're also on separately in addition to that. And it's just a matter of having people, under, voters, understand what they're being asked for and who's asking, and are they getting more than one piece of the pie? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, right. I don't know the answer to why they're not all on individual. So the, the allocations are bundled into the community fund. And, and so in, if somebody wanted to vote for some but not for others, they'd have to vote down the whole city budget as opposed to voting one at a time. I think that was Correct. The, mm -hmm. yep. the background of the question. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No. Did you have no. more to? Okay. No. Um, Zach? I... Um, I would uh, trust the voters on this matter to be able to, I don't really, I'm not into the bundle because it's, um, you know, it was better to have choice in the, um, and it could be cumbersome, I hear it, but, uh, you know, it's also, you know, I would want to look at how we communicate that we may be giving two pieces of the pie, I agree with Tim, it's possible because that's been an issue for me as a voter I've struggled with. Do we give them extra pie here um, when the others are, you know, saying, yeah, they can go out and petition, but uh, it can be difficult. As I said, I think choice is uh, really important. It also kind of gives the community a look at what organizations are, are there providing or asking for the money. And nonprofits uh, give a bang for their buck for this. Uh, usually cities... Um, have to hire their own services in other states and counties, all that. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. Palin. Uh, I think for the clarification and communication and also inclusion issues, individual listings are better. If we think about um, people like me, right, um, English is not their first language, it will be easier to understand what they are being asked to say yes or no. Some some people, like me, we are citizens. Some people, like Montpelier, just 
um, approved that non-citizen voting. So there will be lots of people this year uh, saying yes or no uh, to the articles. So it is important uh, for inclusion issues, I think, to have like very specific, clear individual listing. And the other, th I think, thank you, Dana, for uh, telling the rules. Since we have specific rules and procedure, uh, and I think if city council uh, and management agree to do, and there's a demand, then anything is possible because it is in our charter rules, right? Thank you. Thank you. So we're getting to our last question, and then we'll end with your closing statements. Um, and I'm going to read from a question that actually was sent in by a Montpelier resident named Christian. Um, and it was a rather lengthy question, so I'm going to consolidate it. This is another housing question. And so Christian is asking, um, would you as a city councilor support regulating Airbnb and other vacation rentals by implementing an ordinance for permitting and license, license, licensing the types of properties eligible to be used as Airbnbs or vacation rentals. As well, I'm just reading from his question, so we'll have to, we, we might have to rephrase it again. As well as what property owners can and cannot do in order to be legally compliant host. So maybe we can consolidate that and say, would you be willing to regulate Airbnb and vacation rentals um, by creating an ordinance around that? And we'll start with Tim. <laughs> Thank you. So, Airbnb, it, it's amazing how big this is. Um, I do think it's something that's evolved recently, and at least in the big picture of life recently. And um, I would favor updating our zoning ordinances to take this into account. It seems like it should be within our zoning code. I don't know that a separate freestanding uh, ordinance is the way I would go with it, but obviously would rely on city staff and professional advice on on codes, but it really feels like it should be part of our zoning. Thank you. Zach. Um, at this point, I would, uh, I would wanna have more uh, discussion um, with the people who would be involved with this. Um, and I would wanna hear from, from the uh, citizenry on this matter, I'm sure very hurt on them, but I would want to hear about this before I would want to take a position, because again, this isn't about me. This is about you. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Palin. Yeah, um, like Zach, I don't know the details, uh, but I understand the request. So if it comes to uh, city council, it will require collective leadership. So as a city council, there are like six people, right? We have to discuss, we have to learn the details. Who will benefit from this? Is it worth it to regulate um, rules? Uh, so that's why I need to uh, know more details about it, but I'm, I'm open if it comes to city council to discuss and learn more, then decide accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Sal. Yeah, I'm. I'm also open to discussing it. Uh, I mean, it's it's um, it's complicated because I think uh, homeowners who who have a, a part of their their home that they're uh, renting Airbnb are are probably doing it to supplement their income and um, to take that away or reduce it somehow uh, doesn't help them, um, particularly if the, if they're struggling to pay their taxes to begin with. Um, so there may be there may be ways to regulate it for uh, you know not non-resident you know uh, investors who who buy a building for short short-term rental. I mean short-term rental is the, really the question. Um, <coughs> if you have space that can be rented and you're renting it by the week instead of you know by the year or a longer-term lease, um, that affects our housing situation. On the other hand, you don't want to penalize homeowners who can use the extra. Uh, the extra cash. So uh, it's it's uh, an issue worth discussing. I, I would need a lot more information before I came down one side or the other, but um, probably worth discussing if it comes to us. Yeah. Thank you. Tom. So I think we're, <clears throat> to some degree in our conversation, so we're making this a little bit perhaps more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, there have been questions from the folks in the room, and I'm sure there are people watching right now who are saying, didn't we just have a conversation about doing what we can to support folks within the community before we support folks 
out of state. And I think that uh, Airbnb, if it's something that brings folks into our community uh, as tourists, as uh, people who will stimulate our economy, great. Uh, but those concerns can't trump those of the folks who are in town right now who don't have an affordable place to live. So the answer to what I consider uh, uh, regulating this part of our housing situation in town uh, more than we are right now, yes, I, I would. I think we have to prioritize the folks in town who do not have an affordable place to live right now. Thank you. Okay, we have come to the time where um, you can make your closing statements, address anything that I didn't ask you. Um, and we're gonna start with the District 2 candidates. Um, again, Palin Khan running for a two-year seat, um, unopposed, and Sal Alfano running in District 2 for a one-year seat who has a, uh, an opponent who did not make it here today. So we'll start with Palin and then Sal, and then we'll move <coughs> to our District 3 candidates. And again, thank you. Uh, Cassandra, Bridge, Orca Media, and Rotary for this opportunity. Uh, since mid-December, I'm serving uh, at the City Council, and uh, it's very supportive, friendly, and a great uh, learning uh, experience uh, to me. And that's why I wanna run again and continue for two-year term. I will do very basic things. Listen, ask, Act. So I am promising everyone I will keep listening to people in my district and other districts too, and then bring their issues to the city council and ask the right questions so they can get more information, more clarity, and uh, they can hear their voices uh, at the city council even if they are not. So I wanna make difference to represent 3% of diverse group in Montpelier, which was 6% in 2010 census. So let's make uh, Montpelier more inclusive. non citizen voting is a great start, but how about representation? So if you vote for me, I will represent and work with other city councilors in a collective way to uh, solve our uh, issues in the community. Thank you. Thank you. And Sal running for District 2, one year seat. Um, Yogi Berra once said that the future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> and I think that's where we find ourselves today. Um, we have, you know, we have serious problems in Montpelier. Then we're not alone. They're, they're really um, national problems. I mean, just about every city in the country has, has the kind of issues that we're dealing with. But Montpelier is a special place, and I, th I think we need to solve our problems in our, in our own particular way. Um, to do that, we need to listen, as uh, if, you know, those of us who, who may be on the council, uh, to what our constituents are telling us. Um, I'm at the moment hearing a lot about infrastructure, uh, about housing, and, and frankly about childcare. Um, so th those are those are things that that we need to solve in the long term, but but in the short term as well. And what what worries me about all of this is that so many of these problems have such a long trajectory that um, I worry that people will will lose lose patience mm -hmm. with the solutions, which necessarily need to be both short term and long term. And so one solution for that is just better communication between city government and city residents, and I, there are a number of ways we can do that. I love the idea of the listening groups that Bellin is doing. Um, I think more individual communication between council members and their constituents would go a long way toward, toward helping that. Thank you. So next we'll hear from the three folks who are running against each other for the District 3 seat. And I'm going to do this in reverse alphabetical order because we started sort of in alphabetical order. So, Zach. Um. All right. Um, this isn't about me when I decided to do this. This is a decision-making process that goes into running. This is about you and what you value, Montpelier. Um, and regardless of who gets elected on March, uh, on town meeting day, um, 
I will be continuing to work with everybody, and I think that's really important to understand as we sit here tonight, uh, this evening, and I, I'm just thinking about things that maybe Tim is thinking about, and uh, you know, how can we do this stuff, and and uh, but I will represent you, and I know you've probably heard this so many times, and I will honestly do that. I will put my issues aside, but I've lived here for 30. One thirty-two years, and I've seen the, the those years where we felt comfortable and everybody was happening, and now we're getting kind of uncomfortable. This is going to be a challenging council going forward. This isn't going to be the same thing. You're going to find we're going to have to make some tough decisions, and we need to hear from you more. That's why if I'm elected, and even now I'm willing to host listening sessions with anybody, uh, so this is really important. We're going to work together, and um, I thank you, and I thank you for inviting me here uh, as a write-in, and uh, yeah, write-ins are cool too. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Zach, and thanks for reminding us that you are a write-in candidate. People will not see your name on the ballot. Right. Tim. Sandra, thank you very much for hosting this forum. It's been really great to meet all of you and interact. Um, and thanks to the Rotary Club also and ORCA for doing two of these now. Uh, it, it's one of the few ways voters get to have a sense of who we are and make their decisions, so it's great. Um, I, I know I have a lot to learn, and uh, stepping into this, if I am elected, it would be, I, I know I'm, I'm going to listen a lot, and try to take it in and, and participate, but um, not going into this thinking I know all the answers by any stretch of the imagination. There are some challenges before our community, but we have a great community and a lot of really amazing people. And I think if we get our priorities on track, we, we can do what we want to do. We can, we can start working on our infrastructure issues. We really need to create more housing, and um, we can get that happening. And we also need to work on some other economic development and build our tax base in other ways, too. Look at things like Bar Hill is a great recent example of incredible new investment in the community. They brought a lot of people into town. It's, it's, it's a really wonderful example of something good we can do, and, and we need to move ahead that way. So I think there's a lot of exciting things. I want to be part of it. And um, if you have questions, whether I get elected or not, feel free to give me a call. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. And uh, Tom, uh, our, uh, also a candidate for District 3. Thanks, Cassandra. Thank you to the Bridge, Orca, the Rotary, everyone for putting this on. I think it's been a great forum. Um, I'm going to take advantage of your suggestion to discuss an issue that we haven't had a chance to discuss much so far, and that is our climate commitment and in, in our environmental commitments in Montpelier. Uh, I think it's absolutely essential that we follow along with now Senator Watson's proposal to get to 90% renewables by 2030, and I feel really, frankly, honored to have been endorsed in my candidacy by Senator Watson, by Councillor Lauren Hurl, by Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, folks who have made uh, climate and environment a priority, and I just I think we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss it at, at today's forum um, in a little bit more length. I'll just say uh, to folks out there who are watching, um, if you are a senior citizen who's wondering whether or not you'll be able to stay in your home because of the affordability crisis in Montpelier, I'm your candidate. If you're a young person who's wondering whether or not you'll be able to make your home in Montpelier, start a family in Montpelier and live your career in Montpelier, I'm your candidate. And if you're someone out there who is looking for someone who will take a step toward a progressive, sustainable future for Montpelier, I'm your candidate. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for coming here today. And um, we'll all see you on the ballot and around town. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And thanks to our audience yeah. who are in the room here today and to the Montpelier Rotary Club and Orca yeah. Media. I just want to close by, yeah. we're, we're still on the air, folks. Um, we're, we're not quite done. I just want to remind our people who are watching that voting is on March 7th, um, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in City Hall in Montpelier. Um, and if registered voters who want to um, get an early ballot, you can request that uh, mail-in ballot from the Vermont Secretary of State's My Voter page at mvp.vermont.gov. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>